Hi, I'm Drew Hutchison. You're tuned to Local Bias. We come to you from the studios of Greenfield Community Television at 393 Main Street in Greenfield, and we are seen throughout Western Massachusetts. Okay, Hadley and Greenfield, but that counts, right? Um, our guest today is Carl Meyer. Carl, uh, welcome to the show once again. Drew. In fact, you've been my guest on the show more than any other person. But what you talk about is so important to everybody in Western Massachusetts because we are all affected by the Connecticut River. It's, it belongs to us, it's and true. it affects it us on a daily level, and people know so little about it. Now, Agreed. Completely you're, agreed. You have intervener status. Intervener status, which nobody is going to understand until we just sort of jump right in there. So let's discuss that. What is that? All right. Uh, I uh, have participated in the federal relicensing of uh, two projects on the Connecticut River out of five that are currently being going through what's called the integrated licensing process, the ILP with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. These licenses will stretch out for decades. They will determine whether we have a living ecosystem in the future for our kids and grandkids or not. And so, the ecosystem right now is suffering and it has been suffering for decades. It is basically done in on a daily basis by something called the Northfield Mountain Pub Storage Station which is not renewable energy. It's actually the, the, the grimmest, uh, biggest killer machine in the entire Connecticut River watershed. I brought one prop. Can yeah, I just yeah, say Yeah, please. This? Let's see. Uh, uh, this is a, a pump storage pro project that was sort of came into being because Vermont Yankee and Yankee Row used to pump out all this excess nuclear power at, light, at night, right? And so, so they've well, what can we do? Well, we'll hack off the top of this mountain and we'll, we'll raise the dam in the Connecticut River at Turner's Falls and back up the river for 20 miles, slow it completely down, suck the water up at night at 15,000 cubic feet per second for hours on end. Let's say that this is a cubic foot. Okay. So let's see if, what do you think 15,000 of these would fill this room, I think, rather easily per second for hours, and it virtually kills everything that goes up into that suction. And two-dimensional modeling shows that the river can actually get sucked backward during times of low flows if Northfield Mountain is, is, is uh, pumping up to the top of Northfield Mountain for a mile all the way down to the French King Bridge, folks. So figure you're a little fishy-wishy and you're trying to survive in the Connecticut River. It's like a series of strokes or heart attacks on a daily basis, Drew. Right. Um, there was a, the, let me just refer So this to isn't just about riverbank erosion. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, this is uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, figured, uh, this is for 2016, Northfield Mountain. Uh, Drew, and this is just for Shadalone, 9.5 million eggs and 5.5 four million juvenile shad larvae. Now First Light argued in their, on their favor with, it, with, their, with their consults that that would only contribute to a loss of 2,200 shad. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which is working in the public's behalf, figured out that it would be more something like 1,029,865 dead shad. But overall, looking at a couple of years, between one and two and a half million juvenile shad are lost just getting sucked into that plant. Now you figure there's probably two dozen or more resident and migratory species that are up in the Connecticut River every, right. every year. Well, think about the damage when this thing is used daily. And then it also is channeled into the Turner's Falls Power Canal, which leaves three miles of riverbed empty and has left it empty since 1972. Right. And who's trying to survive there at their only naturally occurring and documented spawning site in the entire Connecticut River system? Drew? The short-nosed sturgeon? The, short, the Connecticut River short-nosed sturgeon, the only federally endangered migratory fish. Um, so that's why I'm an intervener. I've been part of this process since 2012. I've submitted a lot of testimony. I've actually gotten a few changes as we're going through this testing. Um, and the reason I intervened recently was because Northfield Mountain in May was apprised that there were short-nosed sturgeon spawning in the river. Uh, one of their consultants and one of their employees knew it. Northfield 
which is uh, First Light Power, um, was doing their own testing because they want, they want their own arguments to show up in this relicensing process, now entering its eighth year. It's supposed to be a five-year process, right. people. Northfield Mountain, and all of a sudden, um, Micah Kiefer of the USGS lab, the Conti lab along the river there, had documented that there were sturgeon spawning, that there were these fabulous two and a half foot long, three foot long fish that have been around since the dinosaur age, and they were running eggs and running sperm. And then all of a sudden, when Northfield's supposed to be dumping 65,000 cubic feet per second over that dam, all of a sudden the water shut off. And it didn't just shut off, it ratcheted up and down for a few days. Ken Sprankle of the US Fish and Wildlife Service was there the next day or two days later, and he was trying to fish with his dad, and he's like, what's going on here? I have pictures of it, and I Do you think they in. were purposefully doing that to try to? I think they did it because really they don't, they have very little regard for what they're doing on the river in, when there's a federal endangered species there. I'm sure it was a mistake, Drew, but if you're trying to prove a point by doing your own testing on the river, you sure as heck don't have employees telling you, have. USGS telling you that sturgeon are spawning in the river and say, oops, we made a little mistake here because that is what's known as a taking in uh, endangered species terms. There's where a lawyer would come in That's helpful. That's $49,000 per incident of interference, killing, or harming in any way a single short nose sturgeon. If that was a member of the public, we would, we would be somewhere else, but so, this is... This. So we need lawyers. So this, exactly, but this is why I intervened. FERC has accepted me as an intervener on this. Um, but this really goes back to December 20th, um, because First Light is actually, it seems like it's a local, nice little local company, but it really is sort of... Well, they were taken over two and a half years ago by Public Sector Pension Investments, which is run by the Treasury Board and held by, in, in, in most part by the Treasury Board of Canada. Right. The Queen, the but Queen that's Mother. Closer, that's closer than France. It, it, was it, is close, G, 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 yeah, it was closer than the Middle East. Um, but this plant gets sold every couple of years. I mean, it's a cash cow, right? It, it, it is a cash cow. But on December 20th, in the middle of the night, when everybody, U.S. Fish, all the stakeholders have sort of gone home, they re-registered um, Turner's Falls operation, Turner's Falls Cabot Station, downstream in Northfield Mountain, as separate entities. As separate entities when this whole licensing, um, relicensing process was predicated on them asking for a single license. And you do this, you re-register your plants in Delaware because you can avoid taxation, you can avoid yes. having any number of employees uh, tagged to you, you can avoid having to give out information and data that might be that might benefit the towns who are supposed to get some remuneration either from the fish that they're killing or the energy that's generated in, in uh, from this uh, killing machine. Right. So uh, I found out on, I think we talked about this, on January 8th I found out because I was just browsing the Federal Register, which people do of course, and I see this thing in there. I put out the word, January 9th, FERC puts out something saying, Oh yes, by the way, this has happened. We're gonna give you 30 days. So everybody finally got the word. I, my, my stuff came out like right away. Everybody filed for intervener status, but then nobody really decided they were gonna intervene in this. And I think it's a way to starve the process. It's a way to starve information and starve money. And the people that run Northfield Mountain, uh, you know, the head honchos, the VPs and stuff, they've been around for quite a few years. And they are part of the whole, ISO New England, New England Power Pool Producers Organization that um, does not allow any media or public nothing access. Nothing to see here, There folks. is nothing to do. And let me see, we got, um, who are these guys? Let's see. There's Thomas Caslow, who's been the Director of Market and Design, and uh, Peter Ryder, Transmission Committee, Neepool Budget and Finance Committee. These guys have been insiders, right? And, and they've been sort of steering this. And Northfield Mountain, over the last few years, has sort of gotten its stripes changed and the markets have changed. You remember when Scott Pruitt came up here? Oh my God, yes. Um, with, with, with one of the commissioners mm -hmm. from FERC? 
Well, nobody knows what they talked about, but the interesting thing is, is Northfield was basically put there to be sort of an emergency power supply, emergency backup, you know, and they dump some water during the day, and they can, you know, they swear they can power a million homes, but nobody really understands that it's really just a bunch of water that takes 33% more energy to put upstream and kill the river right. and give it a heart attack daily and kill fish than it's ever gonna put back in the system. Right, so it's got it's got that much water, but they say they can power power a million homes, but that's for six hours. They are dead. They have to start killing the river again, and right. they want you to believe that at some point, your little solar your little solar plants. This is a gallon of water. Can you imagine how much solar energy it's going to take? You want to power your home first, and then you want to push this gallon of water like 900 feet to the top of a mountain and bring it back. This is a net energy consumer. Right. And it, there's nothing green or renewable about killing a river. Drink. It's just a profit-making machine for the owners. So, yeah. Now, one of the things I, I don't understand is, it, is, isn't it true that they're not supposed to, to uh, cut off the water during certain times because of spawning going on? I mean, isn't that... Well, that that's, been, that's a known factor. We, we've known about the sturgeon in the river since I think National Marine Fisheries got the word from Dr. Boyd Kennard in right. 2004, who did his work at U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and Conti Lab here. So it's been a known quantity, and then it's been on the table in these talks since, I would say, day one, since but they, 2012. But they've ignored what they're actually, their, their duty is well, to not to cause... Well, they weren't required in, in the current license but if you're doing test flows on the river, right, to see, because we want more flow in the river. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is on board with this. National Marine Fisheries, who have the biggest oversight on short-nosed sturgeon, is on board with this. They're going to have to put at least 6,500 cubic feet per second in the river when we get this new license. Okay. Um, it's, but it's all about, so they, so... First Light was doing its own testing because they wanted some new evidence to present that maybe we don't need. So I don't know why they're doing their own testing, but they were doing their own testing. They were testing flows. They were notified days in advance by Micah Kiefer at the USGS federal agency that there were sturgeon spawning. And I, you know, I have the emails and I sent it in with my FERC stuff. So they knew about this. This is their responsibility. And they ratcheted that river right down. I went there this morning looking for people, and there's nothing but sand and cobble and, and stranded. And that's how you chase spawning sturgeon out of their only naturally documented spawning site on the river. I was there this morning, Drew. I was there this morning. You know what else is going on there? The Turner's Falls Canal is completely empty because I got to muck this thing out every year. Right. There are literally thousands of dead fish sitting in the, there because it serves as the river more than the river does for right. more months out of the year. Right. There are actually freshwater clams by the thousand, which are stunned, and you're probably having an October clam bake because they're just sitting there desiccating. But the banks right above Rock Dam are just kind of bleeding and tumbling in. There are, there are a couple of uh, hemlock trees that have, that have fallen into sinkholes. Um, there is what I believe the, the people at Connie Lab say is manganese, this red oxidizing stuff. And it's, it's from the water that is coming from their canal is the only water source nearby. But these are the banks of the very Connecticut River above short nose sturgeon spawning habitat. And all this flow is undercutting the banks and, and, and they have been beholden to take care of this area since so the, the beginning of their license. They've, they've, they've been more than derelict. Yeah, 10 years for 10 so years. So how can they even justify having their license renewed? Well, this, this, is, uh, this is a little bit of how my intervention argument goes. If, you, if you're not in compliance with your current license, which is two separate entities, right. and then you request from FERC, at the 11 hour and 59 minutes, oh no, we changed our mind. We want to have four different LLCs and go all these things, different things, which is one way of starving perhaps the Turner's Falls area where you're going to need improvements and a fish lift and putting a little more money up here. But it really basically, I think it starves the process. So that was my argument is sort of like, well, 
you can't sanction this if they're not complying with their current right. license. How can you they're let not them acting split in good the faith. company? And they're not acting in, in, in compliance with the Endangered so Species if there was, Act. So if there was a group like the uh, Connecticut River Watershed Council or whatever they're called now. Riverkeeper. River let's, keep, call, let's call it a group with a lawyer. If there was... If the, that had a lawyer, right. they could go to court and they could put an injunction on or they could do something. If there were 48 sturgeon known to be in the river that day and they cut off flows and those sturgeon were gone and you interrupted, that's, well, 49,000, I think we might have done this, but 49,000 right. times, dollars. whatever, you know, it's all this money. And that's why you need somebody. I mean, I, I spent much of the summer going down there and taking pictures. I, I've so you've been documenting. So you've been right, well, you've been documenting. I don't even like, I have, no, there's no joy in it for me. But I, <laughs> well, but the thing is, is that so th it's been documented that what they're doing it is causing this harm. It's been documented that they knew about the spawning. Yeah, those emails exist. Yes, those emails so exist. They, they so get sent that in. that actually seems criminal. Well. You know, and then that's, uh, that's, we're going to see what FERC has to say with it. You know, I'm doing that. And meanwhile, you know, a, a month later, I find a, 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 there's a little video online with Andrew Fiss, the director of the Watershed Council, um, trying to push recreational boating and, and kayaking in the river during these test flows. And I'm like, really? This is the most ecologically sensitive area in the entire Connecticut River, archaeologically, culturally for Native Americans. And it's and falling habitat, apart on right. the banks, right. and this is where you go with it. So this is why you know we really we really need another entity. The Watershed Council can continue to do what they do, and you know do what they do best. They, but they, know, they test not. water. They test water, for, so that you can tell people whether it's good for boating and whether you can swim in the river. So be that, be that person, right. be that person. But they're Plants not a trees. steward, or they have not acted as a proper steward. Well, for the they, river. they haven't acted on the big issues. They have been content to live with a killer in their midst. The Be thing that basically tears apart an ecosystem, a four state ecosystem, the biggest river system in New England. And if you remain silent on that and you can't go after it, you're okay, complicit. just move out of the way. Right. Just move out of the way. Because but, people but, probably feel, oh, well, they'll take care of it. Well, that's, but not. that's the sense. I mean, so now, right now, you know, I, right now there's a big photo con. Send in your photos of, of the stuff you picked up along the river during the hour. And it's, 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 it's a, the biggest self-congratulatory event of the river year. And, you know, I, I think it's great that people go out there, but tell them the truth about what's going on. I mean, right now, um, the Massachusetts Audubon Society and First Light employees up at Northfield Mountain are doing something called Project Wild and Climate Change. And they want teachers to come. No teacher in there in, with any integrity should take part in this when they're not talking about what a killer machine Northfield is. And Northfield Mountain is literally an enabler of climate change. There are these big regional transmission operators, and we have ISO New England, and they're all based on having a glut of power and endless electricity. And elec electricity is our biggest uh, addiction. Right. It's the opiate of the masses right now. On, on, on First Light's website, it says, we can power 170 million cell phones for a year. Well, isn't that wonderful? Isn't that what the public needs at this point? But climate change, right now, they're operating on fossil fuels, right? right? All the nuclear power plants are down. They want you to think that we should build wind energy out at the coast, send it here to kill the Connecticut River ecosystem and kill all those fish, and then they're going to sell it back to you. We're, you know, if, if that's the best environmental thinking you have, think this through, folks. Think this plan through. At a time of climate emergency like we're in, we should be saving ecosystems. Okay, so what can the person at home who's watching this, and there's like, I didn't, I, what, 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 it's, 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 it's overwhelming. Here, what it? do I do? What do I do, Carl? Absolutely. Well, there, you know, there's a couple of things. Uh, you know, I want to let you know that who is standing up for the river. Um, Ken Sprankle, U.S. Connecticut River Coordinator, is doing a lot of testing and work. Melissa Grader, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Julie Crocker, National Marine Fisheries, is sitting at the table with Bill McDavid. They're all pretty, they're standing pretty tough. Um, Mass Division of Fish and Wildlife, uh, they've, been, they've been miserable. They have been miserable. I hope they collect themselves, but they, they also give money to the Watershed Council. So does Mass Department of Environmental Protection. This is why you never go to bat against the sewage, you know, the raw sewage entering the river. But these are people you need to know. Wendy Weber, who is Region 5 Director. Um, these are people that, you know, you need to know about. You can probably get a hold of them. 
Uh, the newspapers are always great. To well, you had a lovely article in the recorder. Well, um, thank you. A couple of, uh, so, yes. I, I appreciate it. The newspapers are, are, are always happy to sort of uh, get some, some word out about you know, what's going on in the river. You know, I, don't, I haven't seen anything about the, the death in the canal, which is a yearly thing. Nothing's getting cleaned up there. I have, I have great pictures. I, maybe I'll have my own photo contest and be the winner. Um, now, I, is Dr. Boyd Kennard involved in any way? Um, Boyd is sort of doing different stuff right now. He's still doing some surgery work. He's also, there. Were, when I went out um, Monday, Monday morning when they first drained the canal, uh, there were people from Conti Lab out there. They were, everybody's into sea lamp right now. This is sort of the lowest hanging fruit on the river, although I wish we would just sort of stick with sturgeon and sort of be protecting habitat. But anyway, they're collecting uh, lamprey for testing at Conti Lab, and Boyd was out there. He's uh, part of, uh, I don't remember the name of the school, but he's got a bunch of kids out there. So we took okay. a bunch of kids out there collect, collecting live lamprey. They're going to do some testing with those. Boyd's working on fish ladder. He's, he's, you know, he's off doing his own stuff. Well, but, that's the other thing. There are actually there are solutions to some of these issues. Well, the main solution, um, either stop using the Turner's Falls Canal would be a wonderful thing. Right. To or the sushi canal is what I call uh, the it. The sushi canal, but but the real sushi, the real the real vegematic is is Northfield Mountain. The real, the, I mean, that's that's it's the, it's the death machine upstream. So the the real the, the best case scenario is a, of this, and a, a real uh, NGO would have tackled this as soon as Vermont Yankee went down and said we got to close this thing off. But anyway, the best solution is. The less frequency you use, either the canal or Northfield Mountain doesn't get to start up during these times. When Northfield Mountain was first conceived, one of the scenarios, and I've read this, was, well, well it's going to be so detrimental to migratory fish that probably we, won't, we shouldn't use it. Of course, that got discarded somehow by the great, uh, you know, powers that be run our grid. But we need more reporting on this stuff. A, a young guy named Max Marcus did, did a, a piece, and he involved me, and it's so complicated that he, I said, sure, I'll talk to you, but you gotta be really careful with it. Now, what facts. about our representatives? I mean, uh, so there's Paul Joe Mark or, or Joe Comerford. Right, Paul Mark, I, these people are, are great. Uh, Ma Natalie Blay, um, these people are great. You know, let's say, look, this is not this is not the way to run an ecosystem. This is not the future. I was talking to Claire. You know Claire, okay? Claire Chang, Solar Store. She's just eviscerating our governor's budget for, for climate because it's all about defense. It's, it's all about shoring up stuff. It, it's not future lifting. It's, it's not enough money, right? right. It, it's just not getting the job done. It's so putting we fingers to, in the dike as what, opposed to... What the truth is about this, we're talking... California is on fire today right. as we talk because right. of the big RTO, regional transmission operator out there. Claire, Claire goes, you know, it's all, it's gonna affect, it's all coming for us all. It's either gonna be wind or flood, but our systems are gonna be down. The answer has always been what's called distributed generation and microgrids, okay? Right. This is resiliency so that we all aren't like starving. Well, think about Puerto Rico. If they had their own perfect systems, example. then they wouldn't be relying upon one big Perfect example, and we could all be Puerto Rico one day, and uh, I hope to Jesus that Donald Trump isn't throwing, uh, throwing paper towels at us, you know, right. in the future. But this is really what we need. We need to restructure the entire, the entire um, system of how we get our energy, and that should, deregulation has been a failure in right. my eyes. We just, we don't know enough about it, and all the deals get cut still in back rooms. Right. And the energy that comes out of Northfield Mountain can now be sold, not just as once a day. They can get paid on different markets. There's a, there's a forward capacity market, they get paid for that. They get paid for three day storage. They can get paid for transmission now, distribution and generation. Right. Just keep cranking the money out, folks, and it's going to disappear into Delaware and Canada. And this energy is not in any way guaranteed to be localized, used locally right. or whatever. You know, it could be going to New York State or New York City or down to some casino or these great uh, sort of marijuana all night uh, lit up factories that we're building. Right. We're kind of off track on, we on are. what we're doing, Drew. But, but, the, but the fact is, is that it's, there's been a gross misuse of the public's, of, of the, of the public's public waterways. Public resource. Public resource. Exactly. This is ours. This is ours, and somebody other than the few of us that are out there has got to sort of take ownership. And that, you know, I mean, that's basically the role that I've taken on, and it gets a little lonely at times, you know, but I'm not saying... Uh, Do I'm, you get I'm, any I'm, blowback I'm, from I'm anybody? Sure. I, you know, I, I, get, I get a little bit, you know, but... You know, I try to, I try to play with the facts. You right. know, 
Um, you know, I was a pariah when I first started going to Connecticut River Atlantic Salmon Commission meetings, and they set policy on the Connecticut River along with the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, National Marine, and the state agencies. So they sort of direct what science and what's needed on the river. And I do want to say this. Um, Andrew Fisk is on there. He's the director of the Watershed Council as a public representative and the vice chair right now. And I think with all the attachments and all the money attachments to fisheries agencies, power companies, privatized water companies, all this money that you're never going to criticize these water authorities. I don't think you have any business representing so, the public. Mm -hmm. And he is now asking to become the chair, I think, at the December meeting. And this is something that I think would be wholly out of line and inappropriate. This is somebody that refers to- So there's a conflict of interest. This is somebody that refers to fish and aquatic animals as critters at times, you know? And I, I just think um, he came from a bureaucracy and, and the Watershed Council is now blossoming into a bureaucracy where they have a lot of finance and development people and this and that. Um, but but where's the out. lawyer? Right, where's the lawyer? <laughs> where's the lawyer? Where's the beef? So, um, Are you hopeful? I have to, you have to stay hopeful. I mean, I gotta be hopeful for young people that are coming after us. I was out at the climate, uh, climate strike in Boston, and uh, you know, it gave me a little juice to get on. It was a busman's holiday. I, I was out on a school bus, which I do drive sometimes. And uh, it, was, it was good to see these people out there. And uh, you know, I, I get hopeful when you know, the newspapers take a little interest and I, I'm always glad to come on and talk to you. you know? and, if there's uh, anybody that's interested in talking, in fact, talking to you uh, in, further than the, our conversation and maybe helping out, you know, they can get in touch with you? They can get in touch with me, carlmeyerwriting.com slash blog. You can, there's an email address you can get there. I'm also locally, I guess I'll give out my real phone number, Drew. Not um, that it's real go, private. Well, I, you know, I have a landline, people. I don't even have a cell phone. 413-773-0006. I got a crank call. Somebody from New Jersey wanted me to police officers today. I can be quite nasty, so <laughs> just be patient, okay? okay. I, ne I never know who's calling. I don't even have the ID thing on my phone. So wow, you can yeah, you're old school. I am wicked old school. Well, and so thank you so much for coming on the show Drew, and updating us. It's a pleasure. Us. Thank you for doing take two because we kind of messed up the first one. It's it's quite all right. Um, I'm Drew Hutcherson. You've been tuned to Local Bias, and I appreciate you tuning in. I really appreciate you getting involved and, and helping out in our communities. So thank you and take care.